Greetings, mortals. Welcome to Fatal Fortunes. I'm Al. I'm Nathan. Join us for a deep dive into some of history's most fascinating characters who live dangerously beautiful lives and whose legacies haunt us today. Hi, Nathan. Hello, Al. How are you? I'm nervous for th- this kombucha. Oh shit! That I've You're brought nervous? to the show. I don't know. Why would you be I was nervous? Telling, well, here's the thing. I've never tried this before. Oh, just listen to that. Yeah. That, oh, I hope you don't spill it ever. Be careful. Is it gonna is it gonna fizz out? No, it's good. All right. <laughs> this is the first ever sip. Yeah, it tastes like yogurt. Um, it tastes like yogurt. I'm not a big fan of drinking liquid yogurt. It shouldn't taste like yogurt. It's probably the coconut that's making it a little creamy. I don't yeah. know what it is. Yeah. That's wrong. It's uh, it's interesting. I will I will finish it, but it's like oh, it's something weird from like my childhood. I can't put is my there finger a bunch on of, what. Is is there a bunch of stuff stuck at the bottom? No. <laughs> Okay, good. good. No, I think I sh- I think it was um, thoroughly shaken in the drive. <laughs> hmm? um, I have one of these boozy teas. Oh yeah. They have these at Trader Joe's, and that's how I first found them. But um, you know when a brand gets good, so then they make like a two pack, or like the pack number two that deviates from the original. Oh yeah, sure. I stupidly saw this at the liquor store, grabbed it, because I said, oh, great, my shit. It's not. It is not. Wrong. Um, Wrong shit. They weren't good, so I took them to a party, and then clearly no one took them, because then I went to a party at that same house a month later, and they were still in the corner. Like, no one had disturbed my booze. So I said, okay, I'm going to just grab one and take it from the party. I'm just going to just take so why is my back? Yeah. And today I'm going to try it because this one is matcha pineapple chamomile and I finally warmed up. I don't think it's that gross anymore. Oh my god, a day of first for both of us. Incredible. I hope you enjoy yours. You're not enjoying yours is what I'm hearing? Um. <laughs> yeah, I think I chose the wrong flavor. Okay, this is I. Okay. This is fine. I'm going to have to, I guess, get, like, a sampler set of kombucha so you can okay. do, like, shooters of all of them Sh- and then know shot. what's up. Yeah. I don't, I just don't, hey, did you, did you see that Connor is listening now? Because uh, Connor left a lovely comment on one of our videos where we talked about his kombucha incident, and he's like, wow, this Connor guy seems like a character. Holy so, shit. shout out oh, to Connor. This kombucha's oh for God, you. This kombucha's for Al. It's. Yeah. I'm not gonna fry my brain with three, and I'm yeah. <laughs> gonna choose a better flavor next time. Well, Nathan and I finally got to see each other in real life for like the first time since May, on so, Friday, mm-hmm. and we went and we saw the new Princess Diana movie, and I think we've had enough time to digest it, so we're gonna give it you know five minutes of our time. Sure this episode talking about it um oh this is riddled with spoilers by the way don't think that this is just going to be covered in spoilers i feel like i could watch it a second time now and maybe try and look past the Anne Boleyn nonsense yeah or like go dive into it or just like accept it or something because that for me was when it really jumped the shark yeah and like obviously it is it is spoilerific what we're going to be saying but also it's like her real life which is why some parts of the movie felt like okay yeah it's obviously dramatized but yeah that whole side plot of her going to her house and almost killing herself but then Anne Boleyn's just like yeah just rip your pearls instead um and then it turns out that like that really awful head like organizer dude was the one who left the book in her room for her to read like ooh the conspiracy of trying to make Princess Diana go insane while thinking about Anne Boleyn. It was a little far-fetched. 
Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I thought that I don't watch Kristen Stewart movies because I have taste. <gasps> and whoa, whoa, whoa! No, no, no! <laughs> never seen American Ultra. You've never seen Underwater. Never even heard of those. Well, I haven't seen them either. But I've heard. Oh, oh, that okay. She's in them. Yeah. I've heard she's a bad actress. I've seen Twilight, obviously. And apparently that's not obvious anymore because I met someone who was born in 2002. So they were only six years old when Twilight came out. And they were Mm -hmm. fully, you know, swabbing people at work. Like, I'm going to nursing school. Oh, my God. I was like, holy shit. It's not obvious to see Twilight? Damn, that was in the curriculum for us. That was the curriculum. But I didn't realize that they were just going to give me a one-dimensional Diana. I really just thought that we could have, like, a character that was more than just paranoid. Like, even with her kids, she's super paranoid. Yeah. And obviously, like, the rest of the family makes sense for her to be paranoid, but... Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of, of biopics that only take up like a couple days of a person's life because it's really hit or miss whether you're choosing the right days mm. and like maybe there were better days and obviously like the other way to do it is like their whole life which is also dangerous to cover that much they also made like a really big deal about the wardrobe and i was like waste of time waste of dialogue waste of time what are we doing guys like we obviously know that there are really a lot of people who are sticklers for rules in the royal family and i'm sure yeah dress should be brought up as one of those things but it's kind of like we know that already we know that you have to dress a certain way because we've seen them for like hundreds of years (laughs) dressing this certain way too much bulimia yeah wasn't a fan of that obviously that is a huge part of her life um but it is very hard to watch but it was enough like this is enough. Yeah. I did really like the music. I think I told you about, like, I don't know if it was, like, a cover. I didn't look it up, unfortunately, what the soundtrack was. But I think the, like, the free jazz stuff where she's getting really paranoid, at least that fit, like, with the tone, I yeah. thought. Just a little too artsy-fartsy for me. It's really trying to get nominated for stuff, I think. And... I can't. Those costume design people were like, let's go. Please, yeah. It's my time. I did really like when Kristen Stewart was Anne. Even though it was ridiculous, when she turned into Anne for a second, I was like, ha, 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 ha. I was like, think funny. about how much time. Yeah, went for like into that, that one shot. shot. <laughs> oh, for her one. Just so much Anne time. Look. Oh, God. Silly. But yeah, and you know, I'm still going to get a poster for my room um, of this movie. I don't. I, I'm just gonna. Yeah. It was visually nice. Hey, you know what? I wonder if my movie theater, if they're playing that movie, I could ask for a poster. Please do. Please do. No, so they totally are. They totally are, because that was the whole reason we went to AMC, because I didn't want to go to my old theater. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so right. then how are I'll, you going to get I'll this poster? I'll text someone. I'd have, okay. I have connections. I've got connections. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I want to start talking about the other British people we were going to talk about today the other british people we were going to talk about today so i've been really interested in this story for a little over a year now it's about you know just white people in africa and i think i just really need to get it out of my system because you know when you have your show that like just puts you to sleep immediately like for a while it was the office for a while it was sex in the city now i can put this documentary on and just pass out snap pass out But we are going to talk about a murder in colonial Kenya, the murder of Lord Errol. I bought this book, White Mischief, by James Fox. James Fox in the documentary is really cute, but if you look up a photo of today, he's like 80. Uh. (laughs) But um, yeah, my local bookstore kept saying, are you sure you want us to find this? Are you sure you want us to find this? And I was like, yeah, I'm sure. Go get it. Because apparently there's another book called White Mischief that's about um, cocaine in Colombia. See, that's like when I first heard the title and I was like, oh, rich people. I was like, there has to be 
drug usage. And there is, there is, but it's, yeah, it's not the kind of white I was expecting. It's just white people. Yeah, and I was like, bro, you know me enough by now to know that I'm getting the niche book on the aristocracy, okay? (laughs) I, of course, wanted to have a light, fluffy evening with my fun things, with my fun, happy history place, and, of course, it's just riddled with racism again, so can't have nothing nice. Can't just have a nice NPR freaking evening um, because there's so much racism, but here, here we are. You know, the one thing about this episode that kind of bummed me out is there are so many different characters. It's hard to, like, talk about the year that one of them was born in because there are a lot of characters. Yeah, yeah. But I like how you have, I like how you have the introduction as to, like, what's going on in the world. Context is is my favorite part of this show. Oh, my God. So fun. But, yeah, so the beginnings of the Kenya colony and the White Highlands. So the British government... They took over the Kenya colony in 1895 to compete with German expansion in East Africa. So they're in control of Tanganyika at the time. Pretty sure that's Tanzania today. The British quickly began to build a railway system. Remember, trains, 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 trains. That's what that whole time period was. And they built a 580-mile long railway from Mombasa to Lake Victoria. And they completed this in 1901, and it allowed for British colonialism to boom. Nairobi was established in 1899 and as the last rail stop for the train before it climbed into the territory of the Kikuyu tribe. The first wave of settlers arrived in 1903 and they're from Britain, Canada, Australia, and South Africa. And I'm kind of confused because I thought that we just started sending criminals to Australia, so I didn't realize that they were allowed to leave. So many of these first new arrivals are, you know, casualties of primogeniture. They're second sons of British peers who stood to inherit nothing from their fathers, but were also, it was looked down upon in this time for people of elevated status to have jobs, but they also needed money to maintain this elevated status, so it's kind of this huge quandary that exists. Some of the Americans that were on the scene were Northrop McMillan, who was a close friend of U.S. President Teddy Roosevelt, who was himself even made a lord by king edward the seventh northrop macmillan that is not teddy roosevelt we'd know that i think i think history classes would have maybe included that um the undoubted leader of the social set was hugh oh my god someone taught me how to say this word calamondoli right how'd you know how to do that so fast yeah i don't know it's like every other letter is a vowel (laughs) It just, yeah, that is a really wild last name, though. Yeah, Hugh Kalamondoli. So, Mr. Hugh, he is the third Baron Delamere, and he first arrived in the Kenyan Highlands in 1897, so before there's even this beautiful railway. And the third Baron, he had a huge amount of wealth, and he had distinguished himself at Eton. If you listen to this podcast, you know what Eton is. It's where everyone freaking goes to school. He descended from... Or he described the Highlands as, like, the rolling hills of Wiltshire, which my friend Trevor, whose family's from Wiltshire, says are actually really shitty. And I think it's funny because they named them the Aberdeer Mountains, and a lot of them come from the Aberdeen Mountains in Scotland. Ha 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 ha. I'm sorry, Africa. I'm so sorry that we just renamed all of your stuff after our wet, damp, not pretty stuff. Yeah. The most bland land so this early settler scheme they were given one million acres each man for a 999 year long lease and this contract required a set amount of capital to be invested within the first five years of occupancy and an annual rent be paid directly to the british government because you know the british they never they never flake on their check the upstarts they would wait for months outside of the land office awaiting a decision from the overworked and overburdened bureaucrats who Obviously, we shouldn't feel bad for. Fuck those guys. Whatever laws were made to protect traditional African rights were often disregarded, so why make them in the first place? Nevertheless, the Rift Valley was occupied by the Maasai people, and it was considered unoccupied because they had nomadic patterns, and this was an extreme political misstep when it comes to the Kikuyu lands because they add millions of acres on reserve for the settlers so the these overworked bureaucrats are now also making crazy mistakes that are 
you know, going to have extreme repercussions down the line. Delamere had the smarts to actually develop relationships with the African population, and he fostered a mutual respect, which did not carry over to the subsequent generations of settlers. And Delamere had the cash to continue funneling money into the colony in the face of chaos. Without him, the farms of his neighbors probably would have failed. Delamere, he had a farm himself spanning over 160,000 acres, over 1,000 miles, and he called this the Equator Ranch, and by 1906 he had fenced it all in, and by 1909 he had no money. He had drained all of the wealth from his family estates back in England, the farm was failing, he's messing up. And Delamere wielded such influence that when he went to the land office and they refused his application for a mill, he stacked firewood under the government building and threatened to set the whole thing on fire. Oh so it was, it was really a Delamere world. What a crybaby. Such a crybaby. Just because he doesn't know how to do crop rotation. That's probably why Wiltshire's so ugly. Because we gave it to this guy. Well, yeah, that's why a lot of Europe is so, like, barren. And why they go to other places is because they don't know how to fucking farm. <laughs> Obviously, the decision against Delamere for this mill thing was quickly reversed once he threatened to, you know, blow it all up. At breakfast, Delamere would hold court with all of the local Maasai chiefs, and they would play his only record all aboard for Margate, which is in the public domain, and we will play some right here. I know a place where the top breezes blow, and without doubt it's the one place to go. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it sucks that they had to listen to it over and over and over again. Oh my god. Because it's, it's not like, like this guy's not rich. He could have other records. The most valuable thing in the Maasai culture was cattle. They never ate, never sold, slaughtered their prized possessions. And the chiefs that had been spending time with Delamere collectively had about 3 million cattle by the time Delamere goes bankrupt. And the problem with that is that now they have more cattle but less grazing land because the treaties with the white settlers had basically impoverished them. And by 1914, at the same time that the First World War is starting, the remaining land the Maasai tribe had was starved and overworked. Other groups that were present in the colony at this time were Indians from India, Somalis, and Asians. Basically, having a servant of Somali descent was the highest status symbol, and many of them, as with the Maasai, they were rich in cattle in their own right back over across the border. Karen Blixen, the writer of Out of Africa, fun movie night, should have it soon, <laughs> wrote <clears throat> that a house without a Somali was like a house without a lamp. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, just let that one... It's pretty that, gross. Let that one sink in, yeah. Karen Blixen went on to describe them also as uh, noble, mysterious, and vigilant shadows. The other native tribe that I had also mentioned before, the Kikuyu, they were first laborers and domestic servants, and at the outbreak of the First World War, they were drafted into a regiment known as the King's African Rifles and worked as porters. They died in the thousands, of course, because they're a tribe that's been largely closed off to the world for so long. They're getting to Europe and falling victim to disease, warfare, etc. The war, you know, was a net positive, though, for the colony. The new land scheme persuaded former soldiers to settle in Kenya and to expand the European population at the end of the war. And the Kikuyu, they had rebelled against the new land acts in 1922, two years after Kenya had officially become a crown colony. And um, that didn't go so well. The Legislative Council was ruled by the white settlers, but the governor of the colony answered directly to Almighty London. The next step that the white settlers hoped for was self-rule, just as Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, had achieved in 1922. The Foreign Office, headed by the Duke of Devonshire, declared that a policy that he would advance would be one that elevated Native interests. And of course, Lord Delamere said, hell nah. Don't even think about it. He went back up to London with a bunch of other settlers and set up base camp at the Mayfair House and lobbied for themselves, of course. Back in Kenya, there began a plot to kidnap the governor. And eventually the policy became that the highlands would be white in perpetuity, no more Indian migration, 
and a limited representatives and a limited representation of Asians in the Legislative Council. Going into the Roaring Twenties, this secured the flamboyant and debaucherous age. I don't really get how they would st- why they would stop Indian immigration because part of the book, part of what the book talks about, but I didn't write down is that a lot of the people building all these structures are Indian. So wow. why would you want less labor force? And the Somalis are rich enough that they can be like, "Fuck this! I'm going back to my cattle on the other side of the border." I mean, maybe because if there are enough people, then they could have representation. They could revolt. Oh. Honestly. You definitely want workers, but if you have enough people that are realizing that they're being taken advantage of, that might not be Wasn't good for Wasn't there, like, a spicy Indian revolt against, like, the East India Company? And there's, like, a fun movie about it? I'm, sh- I'm, sh- I'm sure. <laughs> but I don't know it offhand. <laughs> I'm sure there were ringing any bells. a lot of revolts. But, yeah, but maybe I mean, it's in the yeah. wake of that that they're like, no, no, no. So, you know, Lord Delamere's party can't last forever. He died in 1931, and Lord Francis Scott, a second son of the Duke of Beauclerc, succeeded him as the leader of the social set. He had been the founder of Kenya's first polo club. I love polo. You want to know where I am on a Sunday? Catch me on the polo field. That's where I'm at. (laughs) This new influx of settlers, they were veranda farmers, as in they sat on their asses and watched farming get done without lifting a finger. Jack Soames, an old Etonian. I feel like we need, like, a zinger sound for Eaton at some point because it's, everyone yeah. went there. Yeah, it's going to be mentioned like at least another time. Yeah, like not even say the word Eaton, just put like a boing. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's what we're talking about. Eaton, he's an old Etonian just like the rest of them. He arrived in Kenya in 1920 and he spent the decade wasted. He offered his guests pink gin every time of the day. And in the White Mystic book, one of his former Somali servants described what a party at the Soames was like. Each house guest was allotted their own servant, and the servants who had escorted them there were not allowed anywhere near the house. And the drinking began at 1 p.m. like clockwork. So I'm wondering, how many people are you having at this party? Like, 20 people? That means you have an extra 20 servants to stand by them the whole time so they can, you know, gather information and talk shit back to you later once they've left? That is Cause then suddenly a recipe there's 40 for disaster. At the party. Yeah. And then plus, you know, all the people coming around with little snacks, the bartender. The great social events of this time were the races at Christmas and the races at Midsummer. Everyone would come down from the Highlands into Nairobi. There were just a few strongholds of luxury, those being the Norfolk House, the Taurus Hotel, and the most illustrious of all, the Mathega Country Club, which still exists today if you're ever in Nairobi and want to check it out. There's also a restaurant in Nairobi called the Earl of Errol that serves like luxury dining meals. The club, it would be empty for days at a time. Then in an instant, it would be impossible to get a table. The man who called all the dining room shots was of course a powerful Somali named Ali. And during the race weeks, dances lasted until 6 a.m. In 1928, Edward, Prince of Wales, he fluxes in along with all this new blood And he visits Kenya and was immediately at home at the Mathega. Edward would have vigorous days of activity and then still insist on dancing all night. Derek Erskine wrote, quote, One night, Edward P. was dancing with my wife, and he suddenly lost his temper with the records which he had said were the wrong kind. And I very much regret to say that aided and assisted by my wife, They picked up all the gramophone records and threw them through all the windows of the old ballroom. Unquote. Damn, no wonder... Okay, so if this is a typical thing, no wonder that guy only had the one record because they're just throwing (laughs) them out the window. It's the only one no one wanted to throw out. I guess so. They couldn't find it. But yeah, as you can see, you know, Edward Prince of Wales had a nice tendency for married women even then. So... It just all tracks. It tracks that he would want a married woman ten years down the line. I was just thinking maybe Princess Diana never would have died if Edward had continued to be king and never had to abdicate. If we had no Queen Elizabeth, maybe Princess Diana could have lived. They said Edward himself would go to bed at four in the morning and be awake at half past six and back at the race course. These people love horses. 
It was also further rumored that he had been offered snow right at the dinner table, which I bet was a test. His date on this trip to Kenya was a woman named Gladys Markham, who caused scandal at dinner when she rolled Edward out of his chair and onto the floor, and was, of course, a huge racist. So racist, in fact, that she got the Aga Khan banned from the Mathega Club. She went on to become the mayor of Nairobi, and the last wife of Lord Delamere. And I just can't believe how they fail upwards. Like, I can't believe that this Gladys woman gets, like, like makes a huge fool of herself, is a huge racist, gets, like, one of the biggest religious leaders in the world banned from the country club, and then becomes the mayor. Yeah. Why do they get to fail upward like this? White mediocrity. More in their set were the Dijonzies. They are a count and countess, Frederick and Alice. Alice was an American who in 1927 shot her lover, who she later married in the stomach, on a train leaving the Gare du Nord in Paris. Kiki Preston, who I had mentioned early, another American heiress and cousin of the Vanderbilts, who Frederick described as a creature of instinct and untamed. Kiki would be a good mini episode because she ends up jumping out the window. Oh. Alice shoots herself right out of her right after her 42nd birthday. So maybe Happy Valley's kind of a misnomer. The stock market crash of 1929, though, thinned out the settler population. You, you was definitely going back to that mansion that you could not sell that had no heating. These people deserve it. <laughs> These people deserve it. Yeah, they deserve it. But, like, I can't imagine for us, like, if 1929 happened again, we were, like, rubbing oh. matches together to survive. Like, Yeah. Now we're on to our, our main murdered man. Yeah, the, the meaty Earl bit. of Error. The Errol. Earl of Errol, yeah, I can't speak. They're just, oh, God, Arr. Earls and Earls, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Earls of Errol were hereditary high constables of Scotland from 1315 and walked directly behind the royal family at coronations. That means Joss would have stood behind George VI family at his coronation in 1937, but they also descend from one of William IV's illegitimate daughters. The family seat had been slain in Scotland, but the 20th Earl sold off the family's possession to pay off the debts of the 19th Earl. Now on to the current Earl, Jocelyn Hay. He's the eldest son of Lucy Hay and Victor, who was a godson of Queen Victoria. And Jocelyn was born in 1901 in Mayfair, Westminster. Couldn't find too much on his early childhood, but he was expected from a very young age to follow in his father's footsteps of diplomacy. Really the only thing in his early childhood was that he attended the prestigious Eton College, but was dismissed in 1918 for harassing a schoolmate. What a piece of shit. I can only imagine how annoying a 17-year-old Jocelyn could be. His father, Victor Hay, was Lord Kilmarnock, briefly turned Earl, who brought his son along for a lot of his work. In 1919, Jocelyn worked as honorary attaché in Berlin under his father. This was mainly because even though by 1920 he had a reputation for being spoiled, he still did not have any substantial wealth and no further educational prospects, so working for a living was the only option. His father was early appointed charge d'affaires, basically the substitute when the ambassador can't show. Victor and Jocelyn were there in Berlin, before the arrival of Edgar Vincent, first Viscount de Bernon, but soon his father was appointed High Commissioner to the Rhineland. Hay stayed in Berlin and served under Lord de Bernon until 1922. My biggest question, and this is a good question that you wrote, I like this one, why are 19-year-olds repping the country? Why are so many countries ruled by children? Um, and yeah, it's like he's going to, it's not even like he's in his country representing his country he's gone somewhere else representing the entire land baby but, democracy baby democracy but as said earlier it was expected that he was gonna just do this he was gonna follow his father's footsteps in diplomacy but infatuation had other plans enter lady adina sackville daughter of the eighth earl of delaware who was recently divorced recently married um, and eight years his senior already a mother of two Lady Adina had been known for her many boyfriends during her first two marriages. Among them was Oswald Mosley, huge fash, huge fashy fascist, um, and husband of Diana Mitford. Soon after she and Jocelyn met, Adina divorced her husband, Charles Gordon, in September 1923. And she and Joss 
married that same year. Adina had already lived in Kenya for a year before meeting Joss, and when it became clear they were no longer welcome in England, they left for Kenya in April of 1924. Kenya's reputation as a place was beyond the pale. They move to a farm Adina inherited in her second divorce, which they name Slains. The next year, they move to Clouds, which is so remote and in a place so hard to navigate that you're going to be stuck in the middle of nowhere partying for years. That is really all there is to do, to do and to know about his early life uh, going into his later tragedy. Jocelyn Hay was absolutely this playboy and didn't seem to mind stepping on any toes, which would later be his downfall. In 1926, Idina gave birth to her and Joss's only child, Diana Denise Hay, who would later, of course, end up being heir to the title. This kind of confuses me because in the documentary, someone recalls that Joss was sterile and that's why there was never any, like, uh uh-oh babies in this story, but the book doesn't address that at all. Like, it goes through their entire marriage without even mentioning Diana. Yeah. Clearly, clearly, government said that's your baby. Yeah. Because she became countess. Inherited it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Weird. So she was born at Slane's and lived with her parents until their divorce in 1930. Idina dominated the social scene at this time and wasn't happy until she paired everyone up with their partner for the weekend. She would walk around barefoot to show off her size three feet and entertain in the bathtub. They were distinct rivals of Lord Francis Scott and his wife, who warned newcomers to stay away from them, lest be ostracized. And he'll come up later in the story. You know, we already mentioned that he was the guy who brought polo to the circuit. And while living at Slane's, their closest neighbor were the Dijonzis, who we mentioned earlier, and their friends, the Detratfords and the Prestons. And, you know, the drugs just kept on coming from there. We do know Joss's Don Juan days in Kenya were full of polo and races, but anecdotes about him are poorly remembered, buried in years lost to drugs and drink. The dramas that used to take place there, however, were unbelievable. Classy dinners quickly devolved into brawls, like one night dinner devolved into a duel between DeJonzi and DeTratford. They're basically fighting over Alice the whole time, and I don't want to spoil too much in case we do a minisode on her. Yeah, keep it a secret. People will just duel. In 1928, Joss's father died after he had become Earl for a second, and Joss, of course, became Earl of Errol, but he and his countess had fallen out, and the bad debts had just become too much. Like, he had married Idina because she had all this money, and he's just wasting it away. Of course, the only job he's ever had is when he was 19 in the foreign office, so he's just spending dough. Earl had also conveniently fallen in love with Molly Ramsey Hill, whose husband, Cyril, was a rancher who built himself a Moroccan-style castle called the Dingen Palace. When Joss stole two of Cyril's Buicks and went off with Molly, the search spanned hundreds of miles, and he finally found them in a tent. He ended up chasing Joss with a rhino whip. In the divorce proceedings that followed, Cyril won... 3,000 pounds from Joss to pay off the debts that they had run up in his name, and Molly was allowed to keep the Dingen Palace. And her and Joss married also in 1930, so clearly also a serial monogamist. When his financial situation with Idina began to go south, he smoothly transitioned into a life with Molly where her estate produced an income of 8,000 pounds a year, which was a lot of money back then. His divorce from Idina is also a loss of his daughter, who is sent back to England to be educated by her uncle, the ninth Earl of Delaware. At around this time, Josh and Lord Francis actually end up reconciling, and he pushes Joss back into politics. It should be no surprise, of course, that Joss joined the British Union of Fascists in 1934, and he ended up then dropping his membership the next year when Mussolini invaded Ethiopia. During the same time, he loses interest in his wife, Molly, after she has several false pregnancies. She then began to drink all day and shoot heroin. Joss even told his household staff, which are, of course, Somalis, that he wanted her to have as much drink as she wanted and didn't care if she died. So in 1939, she died. Wow. Yep. Joss doesn't benefit from her death. He's kicked out of the Dingen Palace and lived in a small apartment near the Mathega Club, paid for on credit, his only currency, you know, being his seniority in the realm and past favors. In his father's will, he only received 300 pounds. So he went from rolling in it 
to bro. So who is Delves Broughton, the man who is also in this Happy Valley bunch? Our prime suspect. Our prime suspect. We'll we'll see. We'll we'll figure out what we think at the end as to whether or not this man was the murderer. But yeah, in part two we'll dive 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 into it. Yeah, he often went by the name Jock. So we got Joss, we got Jock, and Jock was born in Cheshire in 1883 and inherited baronetcy in 1914. Because of his ill health, he never was called for active service in World War I. He instead gambled quite a lot. Um, so we've got, yeah, a bunch of dudes who don't know how to handle their money. And he's definitely a man who's only in it for himself and seemingly does this all unscathed. Um, he purchases a Kenyan coffee farm in 1923. And this had been shown to him by Jack Soames. Jock's wife, Lady Vera, was rumored to have eaten human flesh while living with cannibal tribes in Borneo. Which, the other day, I saw this, like, cooking show where it was, like, guess the ingredient. And it was, like, human flesh, um, like, dolphin or, or shark or something. like, And it was human flesh. Oh, my God. Where'd they and get it's that like, from? I mean, so the thing, so the thing that it made me think of was like, if you're willing, and I know there are a lot of, a lot of people out there who like <laughs> want to be eaten. Uh, yeah, if I, you're willing, we could donate your body to Top Chef. Yeah, why not? <laughs> and like, it doesn't have to be the whole. You don't have to like sacrifice your whole body. You can just sacrifice like a limb. Um, yeah. So why not? I don't. Aren't I don't they think that I would. That the Capitol riots are a blood sacrifice, or no? They're saying the Astro World was a blood sacrifice. Oh my God, yeah, that's yeah. just like so disheartening to see all the people who are like just not getting that it's not a. You don't have to make it about anything religious. It's just a horrible tragedy. There's no happened. cult. There's not yeah. every mass casualty event is something conspiracy theory related. Yeah, it's just like a lot of bad decisions that ended up you know how it how it ended up but yeah uh back to human flesh i i wouldn't personally go out of my way to find it but i wonder i wonder if i wouldn't be so opposed if i knew it was um sourced ethically so you know food for thought that's not happening in borneo you might be right about that one. it's not halal out there 1935 we're in right now. In 1935, Lady Vera deserts her husband, Sir Jock, Henry John, whoa, Delves Broughton. Yeah. That's a long name he's got That's there. That's apparently his full name, yeah. That's just too much, so I'm just going to refer to him as Jock. And she leaves him for Walter Guinness, First Baron, Lord Moyne. Who's the I first wonder, husband of Diana Mitford, actually? Is he related to the Guinness family? Yes. Wow. Them Irish people got babies on babies on babies. In 1939, Jock knows Diana Caldwell, who's this person that he's he's actively pursuing, right? Yep. And in that year, he's he's short on cash because of all that gambling he's been doing. And he is charged with insurance fraud because he reports pearls stolen from Diana's car and painting stolen. So he he probably was the one who stole those paintings and stole those pearls, as I feel like a lot of insurance fraud. Like, this guy was short on cash, and then magically things got stolen. And there are there are a few other things that magically go missing in this man's life that we'll get into later. But at 57, he's marrying Diana Caldwell, 26 years old, gross. Um, it's 1940, and this is shortly after his official divorce from Vera. Because of that disgusting age difference, Jock thought of a plan. His great idea was that if Diana did find someone younger, that he wouldn't stand in her way, and he'd immediately divorce her. So that's kind of creepy. And, and this like, deal... give her alimony. And, oh, right, and, like, 5,000 pounds a month or 3,000 pounds. Like, it was, it was a pretty yeah. big 
uh, allowance that she would be getting. I mean, what what people talk about is probably he was just not wanting to compete. He knows that someone who's younger um, probably can fuck better than he can. Yeah. Who is that person? Jocelyn Hay. Jocelyn Hay, um, he's this spry young man. He loves to home wreck, and he immediately falls for Diana Caldwell. So, as he had become a widower in 1939 because of Molly's death, Jocelyn met Diana in 1940 at the Muthega Country Club where they started their affair. Basically a week after Mary and Jock. So, did not waste any time. It was yeah. planned that Diana would be a countess via Jocelyn, and Jock gave his blessing for the relationship as he promised. So this was just seen as another step in... Diana's social climb. And he gave that blessing the night before Jocelyn's murder. This is the the night that this murder happens. It's January 23rd, 1941. Diana, Jock, June Carberry, and Joss um, with their crowd, they all had dinner at the main part of the Mathega Club. They all act, you know, pretty friendly, cordial towards each other. Jock toasts Diana and Joss. He gives that blessing. And he hopes that their future union would would be given an heir. So he seems pretty hopeful for Diana, at the very least. And Diana and Joss head out dancing, and Jock just asks that she comes back home that night to meet up with him and June, who... um, June and him are just going to stay at the Mathega and continue to drink. Joss brings Diana back at 2.30 a.m. on the 24th now and walks her inside. He got back into his Buick, and this is where things get a little bit gray. We don't really know what happens, but at a crossroad two miles from Jock's home, Joss is found on the side of the road, shot in the side of the head. I think it was some, like, milk delivery person who ended up finding the body. Yep. And this crime scene is handled horribly. All the evidence is destroyed. Yeah, they were not handling forensics well at all. The only evidence that you really get is these white scuff marks that are left on the car seats um, and 32 caliber bullets. Also, there's some black gunpowder on Joss's face. But we'll be back next time with our suspects the trial, and what happens to the remaining players of the Happy Valley set. This has got to be a part two for how long and how dense these people's lives are. How dense these yeah. people are in general, I guess. One of the podcasts that I use as a source, um, their episode is three and a half hours long. That's Could something like I... A whole weekend. You gotta listen to two times speed on that one. Oh, and they literally sat there and they were just talking the whole time. Like, they didn't take a break. On Tuesdays, we talk ghosts. See you next time.